Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm Keith Poston. Carroll Middle School in Raleigh is scrapping letter grades for a new approach that is gaining traction nationally known as competency-based learning and grading. We're going to talk to the school's principal, Elizabeth McWilliams, on why they're making the switch. In the second segment, we're going to introduce you to the 2018 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teacher of the Year with an unforgettable name, Freebird McKinney of Alamance County. Before we tackle our main topics, we open with our headlines, a quick scan of education headlines. One week after State Board of Education Chairman Bill Coby announced he would not seek re-election as chairman, he submitted his resignation from the board itself, effective September 6th. Coby, a lifelong Republican who was appointed by former Governor Pat McCrory, said he wanted to make room for new leaders to lead. Because Coby is resigning before his board term ends next year, Governor Cooper will name a successor to serve out his board term. State Superintendent Mark Johnson addressed the State Board of Education last week, a few days after rolling out a new structure and some new positions at the Department of Public Instruction. The reorganization includes the creation of an educator recruitment and support division whose top priority will be to speed up approval of teacher licenses. A recent report found that it could take as long as six months for some teachers to get licensed. Johnson said he also wants to focus on reducing student testing. Brad Wilson, former CEO of Blue Cross and Blue Shield and the current chairman of the Governor's Commission on, sound, on Access to a Sound Basic Education, released a statement last week blasting the recent cuts DPI, at DPI ordered by the General Assembly. Brad Wilson specifically pointed to cuts that forced layoffs in the division that supported the state's lowest performing schools. He said, once again, cuts to our state's public education budget are disproportionately and negatively affecting the students and schools and districts that are likely to suffer the most from the cuts. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click on Education Matters, and read more about each of these headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the show, today we're going to learn about a new approach to grading at a middle school in Raleigh, and we have the principal here to tell us all about it. Elizabeth McWilliams, Principal Carroll Middle School in Raleigh. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, now I called it in my opening competency-based learning and grading. Now you may have a better way or a different name, but I guess explain to me what it is exactly. So when we're talking about competency-based progress reporting, basically what we're doing is we're just, from the outset, clarifying our desired outcomes for students. And so it's about being on the same page and increasing communications with parents and students um, and teachers in the school community to ensure that we're all working toward the same end game. Um, we would like to reduce the, um, the lack of certainty around what we would like students to do with what they know. Okay, so so and in, in, and I said it would be you would be scrapping um, letter grades. So that means no, in at middle school, Carroll Middle School, starting this year, no more A's, B's, C's, D's. Is that that's right? That's accurate. Okay. So when students come to school, we want them to experience a learning environment that's relevant and rigorous and meaningful, um, and we want to be able to meet them where they are performing, right? And so we want to look specifically at their skills and abilities, um, and we want to be able to ensure that, um, that the learning experience is really uh, meaningful and relevant for that specific child. And so, and so, I'm, I'm, so I'm guessing then that the sort of the philosophy of competency-based learning is that the is that letter grades themselves are actually can be uh, a, a deterrent or a detriment to that that kind of learning process that you're talking about. Well, I think that the concern is is that the letter grade doesn't really tell us um, specifically what the child um, knows or has mastered, um, and then. Um, also doesn't provide us with information around what the child can do with that information. And so it's important for us um, that students um, are assessed on a learning continuum, right? And so uh, with learning, there's really no end point. Um, and so at school, we want to ensure that we're giving kids ample time and space um, to be able to learn and progress um, based on their personal needs. Right. Okay, well, I mean, you and I were talking before we started. You're a parent. I'm a parent. Um, okay. What... Um, 
So what is it for, from a student perspective, from a child perspective, what do you see as the biggest pl uh, plus to kind of moving to sort of this, you know, I kind of look at sort of a list of these are the things that your child has mastered, that your child knows at each, in, in each subject. I mean, so what's the benefit for the child? So sometimes kids come to school and um, feel like the learning is done to them. Um, and with competency-based learning, we're really including the students um, within that process. Um, and we're talking a lot about, um, you know, what does the student already know and, and where does the student want to go? Um, and these are actionable steps um, that make sense for that specific child to be able to accomplish his personal best. Right. All right. So I'm going to, you know, so I'm going to, you know, sort of play a little devil's advocate as a parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know what happened when uh, North Carolina moved away from Algebra 1, Algebra 2, sort of the traditional math sequences that everybody sure. grew up on, like I did. Mm -hmm. um, there was some pushback. Um, I'm guessing that you're probably going to have some parents like, what do you mean? I don't know. How can I tell if my child is doing a good job if, they, if I don't see whether they made an A, B, or C? Right, and that's completely fair. Anytime we are starting to do things differently or innovatively, um, there are questions. And so um, for me as a parent, um, I would welcome the opportunity to really know specifically um, you know, wh where my child is performing. Um, and so when my child comes home and, and potentially um, has received a B, um, that doesn't tell me really um, what was missing in order for my child to perform um, more successfully. Right. And so um, with competency-based progress reporting, uh, parents will be, be um, excuse me, parents will be able to look um, and see specifically um, at um, a, a rubric mm -hmm. um, where their child was performing um, and then um, support their child uh, with actionable steps to be able to move that child from progressing to meeting to exceeding. And probably I'm thinking as a, as a, as a former classroom teacher yourself, this is, I mean, this is what teachers, this is how they look at students anyway, right? They're, they're, they're thinking about, okay, what, what has this child mastered so far? Where do, where do they need more help? So this will actually make it very clear to both the parent and the student, um, sort of, okay, where are the parts? Okay, they got this, they got this, but we need to do a little more work on this other area. Is that right? Is that, am I describing it right? That's completely accurate. And, you know, learning isn't a one-size-fits-all model. Um, and so it's important for our teachers to participate in this process, um, which is probably what I'm most excited about, right? It's, it's a system that really is built from the ground up. Um, and so, again, as a parent, I want to know that my child's in a classroom where the teacher um, really fully um, understands and recognizes, number one, where my child is performing, but number two, you know, where my child is going to go. Um, and so every single day, um, having an informed classroom experience um, is just incredibly meaningful, and I'm excited to see what the outcomes will be. And I'm assuming, I mean, again, as a, as a public school in North Carolina, I mean, regardless of how the, the grades are done, it, the, the students have to meet certain things as far as the, the standard course of study. I mean, the teachers set their own curriculums on how they get there, but your, your parents can rest assured, I'm assuming, that uh, they're going to get ready for what they need for the next grade and for the next level in their educational career. Absolutely. So our standards aren't changing. The curriculum's not changing. Um, the difference is that now our teachers are really thinking intentionally and deeply around what it looks like um, when students are meeting those standards. Right. I want to, uh, to, as we wrap up our conversation, I want to ask you, uh, you, you first came across my radar screen a year, a year ago um, when you got some national news coverage, uh, I, you know, uh, about the principal that makes house calls, and you were you were shown that you were visiting every student's home. Now, Carroll Middle School, a thousand students, is that right? That's correct. You're, are, I guess I guess why mm -hmm. <laughs> and how do you find time and sort of why is it such an important uh, part of the way you approach school leadership to go visit parents and students in their homes? Sure. I think initially um, in coming into the Carroll community and not really having um, a relationship with the students and parents and teachers, um, it was important for me to be able to get out um, and meet the people with whom I was serving. Um, and I think in education, we're a customer service business. Um, and again, sometimes we do school to people and to families. Yeah. Um, and so it's important to engage um, our customers in the process of learning and teaching. Um, you know, and I think um, initially it was an initiative um, that I tried to tackle independently, and it's now grown really um, to a more school-wide initiative where our teachers are making home visits and um, we begin every year, you know, with the neighborhood crawl. Um, it's just about making connections with people 
um, and doing our best to serve and support. And breaking down those walls. I mean, like if parents, some, some maybe parents don't feel comfortable. Maybe they didn't have a great experience in school sure. and sort of demystifying it. So. Absolutely, and, and that's often the case. Um, and, and, you know, other times um, parents are able to, to make it to school events, um, but there's something special about having a member from the school community visit your home. Great. Well, thank you for coming in today. Uh, we be interested to hear how the first year goes under this new process and the feedback you get. Maybe we'll get you back on in a year from now and kind of get a sort of a status check. But thank you so much for coming on today. Wonderful. Thank you. All righty. When we come back, you're going to meet North Carolina 2018 Teacher of the Year, Freebird McKinney. But before we go to break, see if you can answer this question. In 2016-2017, 35% of high poverty schools in North Carolina received Ds or Fs for their school performance grade. What percentage of all other schools received a D or F? Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Paragon Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer A? While 35% of high poverty schools in North Carolina received D or Fs in the state school performance grade, only 4% of all other schools received those grades. Joining us now is our 2018 Teacher of the Year, Freebird McKinney. All right, Freebird, I've got to start with the, the, the obvious question, I guess, is where did the name Freebird come from? Well, it, it's, a, it's a great way to start the first day class because I believe that the name gives a lot of students a way to tap into the human story. Okay. So name gives value and meaning and purpose. And so I start off by explaining I've had three full names in my life. So I was born Brian Derek Strong and then my parents were divorced. And then I was adopted and my name became Brian Derek Freeburger, which is where the nickname came in. Okay. Then they divorced and so when I was gonna get married, uh, I, I wanted to honor a constant, which was my mom. So we took my mother's main name, which was McKinney, and my nickname, and so uh, formed a new name, Brian Freebird McKinney. Well, it's a great way. It's a great way to tell the story. Of course, and of course, I, look. I grew up. I'm from. I'm a native North Carolinian. I'm from Fayetteville, and so when I mentioned, you know, of course, when I, I either want to yell out Freebird when I when when you first got named, <laughs> and 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 half the people that I work with didn't know any have any idea what I was talking about. So I I have I've been I've sent some. Um, you know, educated them about yeah. Leonard Skinner. So I, I was, and by the way, did you know that just a quick, and you probably did if you've used Freebird as your name, that uh, the, the, the name of the band came from their high school teacher. Did you know that? I did not know yes, that. Yes, it's a, a true, story. it's a true story. I'm going to add that to In Jacksonville, Florida, the band, the original band members got sent to the office by their PE teacher, uh, Leonard Skinner, because their hair was too long. Um, and so when they became, they decided to form the band then to, to honor him, I they called it. him, they I called themselves it. Leonard Skinner. How about that? All right. So let's, let's jump into a little bit about your story. You just told a lot of your personal story. Mm -hmm. but So tell me during that process, when did you decide you wanted to become a teacher? I, I think every teacher has that story. And mine starts with uh, my 10th grade English teacher, Doug Pierce. Uh, and then he, he became my humanities teacher, my, cr my cross country coach, my, cr my track coach. I uh, babysat for his family. And I think what ended up happening is I, I see that a teacher's value, their capital lies in their investment of time and where you put that time. And most often for us, it's we put that time in our students right. and, and, and making sure that our students have you know, quality instruction. But then, I mean, transformative learning takes place outside of the classroom. So where are, you, where are you dedicating that time? And Doug dedicated so much time in my life as a coach, as a teacher, as a mentor. He was my first kind of entree into philosophy. So, I mean, he really lit that fire that later on down the road I actualized by becoming a teacher. Right, I should have mentioned at the beginning, you've been teaching now This is your, for 14 years. Yes, sir. Right, and yeah. uh, you, you've currently, I don't know if this has always been the case, you teach world and European history. I do. And I know a lot of folks, uh, so I know here in Wake County, you, you've been developing an international baccalaureate program we, up in Alamance. So. We have. So uh, I taught at the IB program at Grimsley, North Carolina, mm -hmm. or excuse me, Grimsley High School in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh -huh. And uh, fell in love with that class, realized just, you know, the ability to teach students 
um, you know, what it means to be human and to allow them to kind of work through that process and self-reflection and self-analysis and then synthesizing that with the Tao Te Ching and Confucius and Peter Singer and Charles Taylor and uh, just it was a, a transformative class and and I realized I was dedicating a lot of time and energy in Greensboro at Grimsley when my my county and and my you know home high school Williams uh, could use that as well. So uh, several colleagues and I started that process, and and we begin uh, in in August with oh, the new IB program awesome. at Williams High School. Well, well, congratulations on being named the Teacher of the Year. It does provide a um, uh, well some unique opportunities and a platform. I mean, you're here to talk mm -hmm. about. It. So, I mean, what do you um, what do you hope to accomplish with this sort of you know? I think folks on the sh who watch our show regularly know Teachers of the Year basically are out of the classroom for a year and and traveling around. You're a little bit of an ambassador in mm -hmm. some ways, but also speaking for and on behalf of teachers of North Carolina. So what do you want to accomplish? Well, and I think one of the most important uh, aspects of this process that I've learned is that I have such a strong regional team. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a microcosm in Burlington, North Carolina, so I, I can't understand everything that's going on around the state. So the regional team, through several uh, amazing uh, benefits like NCAT, uh, has been able to sit down and meet and really formulate a, a platform. So we kind of have four main uh, aspects of that that we want to work on. The first is building bridges. Um, I call it becoming the village teacher because that's kind of what I've tried to emulate my whole uh, professional career. But really it's developing relationships at all levels of our community because I believe that the teacher can be a truly transformative individual in a community starting with the self and then with their classroom then with their school and then the community. Uh, and so we want to kind of energize teachers around the state to say, you know, you, you have the potential to really be the change that you want to see in that community. And then that also leads to making sure that public education provides access to all students. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's, you know, racial justice, that is socioeconomics, that's ESL, EC, that's PE, that's the arts, right. that's uh, NCVPS, that's every child. charter school, everything, right. every single child. Also, we want to focus on teacher recruitment and retainment and retention because um, we feel like this is the, the greatest profession on the face of the earth and what we can do in our classrooms and outside of that, we want all teachers to realize that potential. But also, once they're there, how do we provide support? How do we make them want to stay in the profession? Right. And lastly, uh, global education and cultural immersion for both teachers and students. Uh, we feel if you're truly going to to actualize as a 21st century learner. We're becoming much more globally uh, integrated and we need to become much more globally minded. And so providing opportunities for both our educators and our students in that realm, I think we could really build benefits. Well, fantastic. The, um, you, you mentioned about re recruitment and retention. We mm -hmm. talk about that a lot on the show because look, we've, we've seen declines in enrollment in schools of education over yeah. the last few years. Um, you've been in the classroom. Mm -hmm. What can we do as a state, also as parents mm -hmm. as citizens to better support teachers to make it something that people want to go into like you did. I mean you felt I mean a lot of te look a lot of kids felt the same way you did about a teacher and then decided at some point this the teaching wasn't for me. What can we do to make that to, to keep that continuum going? Well I, I feel very blessed. Alamance County has developed a, a, an unbelievable kind of system and it starts with a group with Impact Alamance and with Teacher Leadership Academy. It starts with the strength of the Chamber of Commerce. It starts at the local university like Elon. It starts with our community college and the strength of that program. So one of the focuses that we want to work with is how do we take all of those community resources and build connections so that our teachers can tap into those and then bring those resources back to the students. And I, in, in, in my opinion, I think that if we focus on building it from the community level and each one of our communities around the state can do that, but then we can share uh, we're working right now with sharing with Rutherford County about our Teacher Leadership Academy, uh, uh, Academy and how we can then kind of duplicate that around the state so that other teachers have this amazing experience. Well, like it, it makes a lot of sense. I'm sure your students love you. We love having you on the show, and we we'll hope you. you'll come back and talk to us more as your, your journey continues. Freebirth, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm honored. After the break, this week's Leadership Spotlight.
Each week, Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight Christina Spears from Wake County Schools Office of Equity Affairs. Leadership Spotlight is brought to you by Participate, where we believe every student deserves equitable access to quality education. Equity is giving people what they need, not necessarily what they want or what everyone else gets. So the Office of Equity Affairs is staffed with the charge of giving people what they need, both students, teachers, our entire school system, and really being specific. I realized I didn't have a teacher of color until I was in graduate school. I was 22 years old. When I got to graduate school and did have a teacher who looked like me, how important that was for me to see myself reflected as a leader leader and as a professional. Students who are students of color really see themselves as leaders when they see teachers who look like them. Looking at specifically helping teachers create classroom communities where their students feel like they belong, where they know their teacher knows their culture, and when students feel that way, they achieve and they do better because students are responsible for learning. It's not teachers who are going to close the achievement gap, it's students. One framework we use in our district is called the Warm Demander Framework, and it's just a way to interact with students. We can be warm, I love you, we can dance, we can joke, I believe in you, but I'm also gonna demand that you achieve. Having high expectations for all students, but being warm and getting to know them is one way to empower students. I'm working with a team of teachers who are co-teaching American History and English 3, and they wanna use a social justice lens and have kids look critically at current events to talk across difference, because that's really hard for teachers teachers to navigate. So we've been working with them to lesson plan and the content of the class, but making sure that it meets the needs of all the students. So that's one way that we work with teachers. I also have a lot of coaching conversations around race and gender and things that are difficult to talk about and really empowering teachers with the language and the tools to have those conversations with each other, but also with their students in their classroom because we know not only are students are our future, but there are now. If you know someone that deserves to be recognized, please visit our website, ncforum.org, click on Education Matters, and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. As I mentioned in headlines, State Board of Education Chairman Bill Covey submitted his resignation last week. Covey has served as board chair for five years, but he has served the people of North Carolina much longer. I first met Bill Covey when I was a student at Carolina in 1985, and he was serving in Congress representing the 4th Congressional District, which included Chapel Hill. I actually volunteered on his campaign in 1986. After one term in Congress, he went on to serve former Governor Jim Martin as Deputy Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Transportation and then as Secretary of the Department of Environment, Health and Natural Resources. He also chaired the state Republican Party. Now, even with all these GOP credentials, Bill Covey clashed with both the current General Assembly leadership and Republican Superintendent Mark Johnson after legislators stripped the board of much of its power after Johnson was elected. It was never quite clear, frankly, why the General Assembly leadership has such a problem with Kobe. Uh, perhaps it was because he had a good working relationship with former Democratic State Superintendent June Atkinson. But honestly, that's just the way Bill Kobe always worked. For newscomers to North Carolina, at least those who have moved here since 2010, it's probably hard to imagine that Democrats and Republicans work together well on education issues. But that's actually much truer to our state's history than the acrimony that we see today. What is also true is that Bill Kobe is one of the kindest, most decent, and honorable public servants I've ever known, and his leadership will be missed at the State Board of Education. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching, and make sure you tune in next week for a brand new Education Matters.